something spinning on my screen. Hmm. It said uh, Zoom cloud server spinning. Uh oh. Well, as long as y'all can still hear me, that's great. All right. So the unit for blood pressure is millimeters of mercury of pressure. All right. So that's the pr this is the unit. So we, we would say that the mean arterial pressure in an average person whose blood pressure is 120 over 80, we would say it's 93.3 millimeters of mercury of pressure. So that's just a unit, right? So basically what I'm trying to tell you is you need to know these two little formulas right here. This is the important thing right here. And you won't necessarily need a calculator on the test. I'm going to give you some Obviously, they're going to be made up numbers, you know, um, so it's going to be even numbers, you know, to plug in here. Okay. Mr. Russell. Go ahead. Should we learn the formula that's in the book or the one that's on this PowerPoint? I, like I said, that now there is a slight discrepancy because there's three, three different formulas that you can calculate mean arterial pressure at, and it gives you a slight difference in, in the decimal place, but you just learn the one I have on the screen. This is the easiest one. This is the one I like to teach. Okay. All right. So you don't have to worry about all them other ones. Just learn from, from this slide. All right. So let's talk about vascular resistance a little bit more, what it is and what changes resistance, what type of parameters can change resistance, right? So first of all, resistance, which is just R, is the opposite force to blood pressure. So basically it tries to oppose the blood flow through the vessel. Now you might think that's bad. And in extreme cases, if resistance is really, really, really high, that is bad. But I will say this, no fluid can move through a tube unless there was resistance. So oil couldn't be pumped through the oil pipes with the oil company unless there was a resistance. Uh, blood can't go through our blood vessel if there's no resistance. And to make this, to give you a very simple analogy, which I normally do in class, if you can envision yourself on a frozen lake and all of a sudden I said, take off running, and you tried to take off running as fast as you can, what's going to happen? Your feet are going to sit there and slip, right? You might go a little bit, but you might even fall down. It's slippery. You know why you don't go fast very quickly on ice? Because there's no friction. There's no resistance. However, if you're on the street and I said, take off running, boom, you automatically start going fast. Why? Because there is a resistance from the ground to your foot. So when you put pressure from your foot to the ground, the reason why you move, is not only because you're putting pressure down, it's because the ground is pushing back against your foot. That's the same thing as blood, pressure, and resistance. So we have to have a balance. But resistance and pressure is linked, by the way. Whatever makes your resistance go up also makes your blood pressure go up. Whatever makes your resistance go down makes the blood pressure go down. So we also have to consider blood flow. If the resistance is very high, then it can decrease blood flow to a tissue. And it's typically due to this first parameter, which we're about to go over, the size of the blood vessel lumen. If on the other hand, resistance can go down locally at a tissue, a, a vascular bed in a tissue, then it can increase blood flow to that tissue. And that's what happens when you work out. We can increase blood flow to some tissues and we can decrease blood flow to other tissues. Because I will say this, which I haven't mentioned as of yet. If you're working out, it's, it's automatically easy for you to understand that your muscles are going to need more blood flow to them because they're working. It's obvious. They need more oxygen. They need more nutrients, uh, glucose to make ATP, right? So it's pretty obvious that when you are working out, we need to send more blood to the muscles. They're working out. But here's the problem. You only have a set volume of blood in your body. So if you have to send more blood to one tissue in the body, some other tissue in the body has to sacrifice. 
you have to decrease blood flow to other tissues. Does that make sense? So in order to increase blood flow to one tissue, you have to take blood away from another tissue. And so we change resistance patterns as our activity levels change and our metabolism changes in different parts of the body. So let's look at what resistance depends on. Well, resistance, the very first one is the most physiologically relevant one, by the way, because this is the one that our body can change physiologically. The other two, we don't change physiologically. But the size of a blood vessel lumen is very important. And so what I mean to say by that is this, if you can increase the diameter of a blood vessel, you're going to decrease its resistance. I'll say it again. If you increase the diameter of a blood vessel, you decrease its resistance. If, however, you decrease the diameter of the blood vessel, make it smaller, you're going to increase the resistance. So you know all that is? Vasodilation and vasoconstriction. That's what that is. So at certain times, some vessels in your body will vasodilate. They get bigger in diameter. And at that time, other vessels in your body and other tissues are going to vasoconstrict. And their vessel gets smaller in diameter. In that way, we constantly change resistance patterns around the body and thus alter blood flow to tissues. So I'll give you a real simple example. When you start to run on a treadmill, your muscles are working out and they need more blood. But guess what system your system that, you're, that does not need blood while you're working out? Your digestive system. Your body is not trying to digest a hamburger that you ate when you're running a marathon. So the digestive system organs all get vasoconstricted. So we increase the resistance there, which increases pressure to reroute blood away from your stomach to a lower pressure area. Blood only flows down a pressure gradient and the lower pressure areas are gonna be where we vasodilate, which in that example is gonna be in your muscles and in your heart and in your liver and in your lungs. Those are the organs where we need to increase blood flow to when you're going through a sympathetic event like a fight or flight response, you learned about in AMP1 or when you're running on a treadmill. So we vasoconstrict and vasodilate in different places of the body, ultimately to alter resistance, which then alters pressure and thus blood flow. So we can vasoconstrict and we can vasodilate. And I'm gonna show you some of that in a minute. Now, blood viscosity is the thickness of the blood. How thick is the blood? Well, I'll tell you this, blood is a little thicker than water. That was a little joke, yeah, but it is a little thicker than water. Uh, so, so the viscosity of blood depends on how many cells, <clears throat> blood cells, there are per unit volume of blood with respect to the volume of water or plasma that's in the blood vessel. So for instance, if someone is severely moderate to severely dehydrated, their blood gets a little thicker. Their viscosity goes up because they lost their water. Someone that's overhydrated, because you could be overhydrated, their viscosity actually goes down a little bit. There's a condition where somebody can have too many red blood cells per unit volume of blood. That's called polycythemia. I'm gonna cover that in a couple of weeks. So if you have too many cells per unit volume, it makes the blood thicker. So it becomes more viscous. So I'll just tell you this, if viscosity goes up, resistance goes up. If viscosity goes down, resistance goes down. That's how that works. And you can think of it this way. Try and envision, okay, you take a straw, you put it in a glass of water, and you suck the water up through the straw. It goes pretty easy. Take a straw and put it in a glass of syrup and try and suck the syrup up through the straw. It takes a lot more pressure to move the syrup up the straw than it does the water because water is much less viscous than the syrup is, right? The other thing that deals with resistance is how long our blood vessels are. And obviously we don't change that. 
That's just your body plan. But where this does come into play is this. So I'll just say, if blood vessel length increases, your resistance is going to go up. And it's going to make someone have high blood pressure. So this comes into play in people that start to become overweight. And especially like people that are considered in a morbid obesity range uh, and have to go get surgeries and all of that, that's when it really comes into play. So by adding all of that extra weight and adipose tissue, they gain more vessels running through all that tissue. So their heart has to generate a lot more pressure in order to send the blood through those extra miles of blood vessels because there's more resistance that the heart has to overcome in order to generate the pressure to cause blood flow. All right, so let's look at our parameters, all right? So what you see, what you see on this screen is a flow chart that describes the relationships of the parameters that affect cardiac output and the parameters that affect systemic vascular resistance. Now, in the engage manual, they talk about what is called total peripheral resistance, TPR. And I just refer to it as systemic vascular resistance, which is SVR, because systemic vascular resistance is specifically the resistance in the blood vessels of the systemic circuit. Total peripheral resistance is the resistance encompassed in both the pulmonary and the systemic circuit. So typically, I just refer to it as SVR, systemic vascular resistance. So on the test, if you see TPR or SVR, it means the same thing. It's the resistance in the blood vessel. So don't get overwhelmed with that. So let's, let's do a recap over here on the left side. Cardiac output. Cardiac output is the volume of blood that the heart pumps out every minute, that diagnostic measurement. So what controls cardiac output? two basic parameters, heart rate and stroke volume. If either one of these parameters goes up, cardiac output is going to go up. Now look down here for blood pressure, the mean arterial pressure. If anything that makes cardiac output go up would make your pressure go up, your blood pressure go up. So let's look at what controls heart rate and stroke volume. All right. So the main thing that controls heart rate is the autonomic nervous system and hormones from the adrenal medulla. So as it turns out, paras the parasympathetic system decreases heart rate, but the sympathetic system increases heart rate. So if we're trying to increase our cardiac output, we, we don't want the cardiovascular center sending out parasympathetic information we want the cardiovascular center in the medulla, which I'm going to show you in a second, we want it to send out sympathetic stimulation. So sympathetic stimulation dumps out norepinephrine as this neurotransmitter on the pacemakers of the heart, and your heart rate goes up, and your cardiac output goes up, and your blood pressure would go up, right? Hormones from the adrenal medulla, basically adrenaline and noradrenaline, epinephrine and norepinephrine from the medulla, adrenal medulla increases your heart rate, which increases cardiac output and pressure. Now, the hormones from the adrenal medulla and the sympathetic neurotransmitter, norepinephrine, also increase the force of contraction of a ventricle. So by increasing the force of the contraction of a ventricle, you're going to increase stroke volume because you're going to eject more blood out on that one beat if you contract harder. And if stroke volume goes up, cardiac output goes up, which means your pressure goes up, right? Now, the other thing that controls stroke volume is the amount of blood that can get to the ventricle prior to its contraction. And if you remember from last week, the volume of blood that gets to a ventricle prior to its contraction phase is called the end diastolic volume the EDV. Anything that makes the EDV go up makes the preload go up, which makes the force of contraction of a ventricle go up, which makes the stroke volume go up, which makes the cardiac output go up, 
and your pressure go up. So how can we increase the volume of blood that gets to a ventricle? Well, you can increase the blood volume. You can hang an IV bag on somebody. Or you could take in a lot of fluid, drink a lot of water, electrolytes, Gatorade, whatever. You're working out, you're getting hot, increase your volume intake. If you increase your volume intake, you're increasing the blood volume that can return to the heart, which increases contraction force, which increases stroke volume and cardiac output. We have accessory pumps though, which I didn't mention as of yet. Your skeletal muscles and your respiratory pumps. So when you're running on a treadmill, your skeletal muscles are squeezing on the veins. And when your muscles squeeze on the veins, since veins have valves in them, it forces the blood through the vein faster. And remember, veins are carrying the blood back to the heart. Oh, my email is blowing up. Back to the heart faster. And if you increase that venous return, you increase the EDV, which increases the preload, which increases the force of contraction, which increases stroke volume, which increases cardiac output, which increases blood pressure. Now, the other thing they have up here, which I haven't mentioned, is venoconstriction. This is basically vasoconstriction of a vein. So some of our veins have, have that smooth muscle tissue in their wall, at least the medium to larger size veins. And so that muscle tissue can contract. And if the, if the, if the vein vasoconstricts, or what we call venoconstricts, it increases resistance in the vein, which increases venous return, which increases stroke volume, cardiac output, and pressure. So this is kind of the parameters that were talked about last week for the heart, All right? Now, what about the parameters for this week with the blood vessels dealing with resistance? Because look at the two main things that control pressure. It's the amount of blood pumped out of the heart every minute, cardiac output, and it's resistance. So anything that makes the resistance go up makes the pressure go up. Anything that makes cardiac output go up makes the pressure go up. So look at the parameters for resistance. What can make resistance increase? Well, the only one that is physiologically relevant, that is to say the ones our body can control, is vasoconstriction and vasodilation. Vessel diameter, or here they just put the radius. The reason why they put the vessel radius is because the formula to calculate this is resistance equals one over the radius to the fourth power. But you don't need to worry about that formula. That's why they say radius. But radius is half of the diameter. I think you guys know that. So that's why I always say just diameter to make it easy. So what is the diameter of the blood vessel? Is it small or is it big? Vaso vasoconstricted or vasodilated? Well, if you want to increase pressure, you want to increase resistance, and to increase resistance, you want vasoconstriction. On the other hand, if your body's trying to decrease your pressure because it's too high, we need to decrease resistance. And to decrease resistance, you vasodilate. You could just reverse it. Now, the other parameters are the ones that we can't change physiologically, the thickness of the blood, which is your hydration state, how hydrated are you, or, and or how many red blood cells per unit volume of blood do you have? Do you have too many? In which case, you have polycythemia, which would increase viscosity, which would increase the resistance and pressure. This we don't necessarily want to happen. We want our viscosity to stay the same, typically, in our body. Also, blood vessel length. We don't want our vessel length to increase because we're increasing body size and obesity because that puts a harder stress on your heart to pump blood out because the resistance gets higher. So these, we kind of want to stay the same. We don't want them to change. Which one do we want to change when we need to? Vessel diameter. So that's why I'm saying this one is the physiologically relevant parameter. All right, so let's look at the control center and then we'll do uh, the blood pressure uh, flow, flow chart, the loop. So here's the control center, the cardiovascular center. I showed you this picture last week. We kind of rushed through it though. So here's the cardiovascular center. It's in the medulla oblongata in the brainstem. Here's the brainstem. This is the control center that controls all aspects of the heart and even your blood vessels for that matter, which regulates your blood pressure. 
Everything that you see in blue are the sensory inputs. So we have sensory inputs from our higher brain centers like your cerebral cortex or hypothalamus. The limbic system is your emotional brain. You might not remember that from AMP1. But nonetheless, what are you experiencing in your world? Did you just see something very scary? Hear something? Did you taste something bad? What you experience in your higher brain centers always goes to the CV center. And then we, the CV center determines what type of adjustments for outputs are required in order to maintain proper blood pressure and blood flow. So all, everything in red is what we call the motor output. Here's the sensory inputs in blue, motor outputs in red. But what I am interested in you getting into are these receptors. I want you to know what these receptors do. Proprioceptors monitor your joint movement, what your arms and legs are doing. So your brain, your CV center, always knows if you're lying down and you're not moving relative to as if you're running on a treadmill. Because if you're running on a treadmill, your proprioceptors at your joints are firing to the brain saying, hey, we're working out. We better increase pressure and blood flow to the muscles in the body. So that's what proprioception is. The baroreceptors monitor blood pressure directly. And so we have these special stretch receptors called baroreceptors. They're in the carotid arteries and, and in the aorta. And if our blood pressure drops or if the blood pressure goes up, that information always goes to the CV center. So let's say the pressure dropped for whatever reason, you stood up too quick. I'll always go through that example. It's called orthostatic hypotension. Everybody probably got dizzy at one point standing up too quick. Your blood pressure basically dropped to the brain a little bit. So you stand up too quickly, the blood pressure falls to the brain, the baroreceptors in the carotid arteries fire to the CV center saying, hey, blood pressure to the brain just fell. We better increase blood pressure, All right? So how do we increase blood pressure? Sympathetic output. Whenever you're trying to increase, you want sympathetic. Whenever you're trying to decrease, you want parasympathetic, right? So the baroreceptors monitor pressure. The chemoreceptors monitor changes in blood chemistry. How much oxygen is in the blood means something. How much CO2 is in the blood means something. What is the pH of the blood? How much acid's in the blood? That's what H, that's what the hydrogen ion is here for. That's, that's pH. So ultimately when you work out, your muscles use more oxygen, they produce more CO2 and they produce acids. So when the oxygen goes down a little bit, CO2 goes up a little bit, the pH drops a little bit, the CV center thinks you're working out. We better increase blood flow to the muscles because we're becoming acidic. We have too much CO2 and we don't have enough oxygen. The muscles are, are working out. So what do we want? Sympathetic output. All right. So depending on what's going on with the inputs, do we need to increase or decrease cardiac activity and blood flow and blood pressure? If we need a decrease output and blood pressure, you want parasympathetic output to the heart. Parasympathetic output releases acetylcholine on the pacemaker of the heart. Acetylcholine is inhibitory on the heart and it decreases your heart rate. And from our formula, if you decrease heart rate, you decrease cardiac output, which would decrease your blood pressure, right? On the other hand, if we're trying to increase blood flow and pressure and all of that, we want sympathetic output. The sympathetic postganglionic neurons from the sympathetic system release norepinephrine. Norepinephrine increases your pacemaker activity, so your heart rate goes up. There's also fibers that go to the ventricles, so contractility goes up. Now notice, the parasympathetic system has no effect on contractility. So that means the parasympathetic system does not affect stroke volume. However, the sympathetic system does release norepinephrine on the ventricle, which increases contractility, which increases stroke volume. All right. So we also have vasoconstriction uh, that can happen at blood vessels. That's with sympathetic output. All right. And I'm going to get into some of that in a minute. So we're almost done with this chart. So here is the negative feedback loop for blood pressure. So 
he, our controlled condition is blood pressure. Some stress or stimulus is decreasing our pressure. The baroreceptors, which are located at the base of the carotid artery up here at what's called the carotid sinus and in the aortic arch, these baroreceptors monitor blood pressure. The ones in the carotid arteries monitor pressure to the brain. The one in the aorta monitors pressure to the body. So yep, the, the baroreceptors fire to the CV center and tell the CV center that blood pressure is falling. The CV center says, yep, blood pressure is falling. We better do something about it. So the output that comes out of the CV center is going to be sympathetic. Sympathetic output goes to your heart and your blood vessels. The heart rate goes up, stroke volume goes up, and cardiac output goes up with sympathetic output to the heart. That increases your pressure. Sympathetic output to your blood vessels causes vasoconstriction, at least in most blood vessels in the body which increases resistance, which increases pressure. Your adrenal medulla is also stimulated to release epinephrine and norepinephrine, which brings about increases in cardiac output and in vasoconstriction to increase pressure. So this loop is gonna run and run and run until your pressure is back to normal, and in which case the loop shuts off on its own. That's why blood pressure is controlled on a negative feedback loop right there. So just go and review that loop. Here's some animation on that feedback loop as well. When you get home, um, when after lecture or whatever, you can view that later on. All right. All right. So the last thing that I have for you is this table. I need you to review it. Everything that I want you to know is pretty much in one place right here. What types of hormones and or some of them are neurotransmitters, but what types of hormones affect blood pressure? So let's go through it. Obviously blood pressure is affected by cardiac output. It's affected by systemic vascular resistance and it's affected by blood volume. So what types of hormones change these main parameters? Well, they're in the middle. And then it shows that what effect on blood pressure we have. So epinephrine and norepinephrine increases contractility and heart rate to increase cardiac output, which increases our blood pressure. Angiotensin II, antidiuretic hormone. Norepinephrine and epinephrine act as vasoconstrictors, which increases resistance and increases our blood pressure. Atrial natriuretic peptide, which is ANP, is a vasodilator. Nitric oxide, is a major vasodilator. Now notice here, epinephrine acts as both a vasoconstrictor and a vasodilator. The reason for that is the types of receptors that are on the blood vessels. So if you look down here, norepinephrine acts on these alpha-1 receptors, which brings about vasoconstriction of the abdominal organs and the skin. All that gets vasoconstricted because of norepinephrine. However, epinephrine can bind to beta adrenergic receptors. That's right here, the uh, beta-2 receptors. These are inhibitory receptors, if you remember from AMP1. The alpha-1s and beta-1s are excitatory. Alpha-2s and beta-2s are inhibitory. So epinephrine can bind to these beta-2 receptors which are found on the blood vessels of your heart and your skeletal muscles. And when it binds to these receptors on your heart and skeletal muscles, it causes vasodilation. So for that reason, when we are vasoconstricting elsewhere in the body, like the, the stomach, the abdominal organs, and your skin, we're vasodilating in our skeletal muscles, in our heart, and our lungs, and our brain because these hormones bind to different types of receptors, right? All right, um, as far as blood volume is concerned, there are hormones that adjust our blood volume by acting at the kidney. Aldosterone helps the kidney save salt water, so it puts it back in the blood, which increases blood volume and increases blood pressure. Antidiuretic hormone tells the kidney to save water directly, not just minerals like aldosterone, but save the water. And in which case it increases our blood volume and it increases our blood pressure. 
Atrial natriuretic peptide tells the kidneys to dump water out. So not only is A and P a vasodilator in the body, but it acts at the kidney, it acts at the kidney to make the kidney dump water out. So it increases your urinary output volume and decreases your blood volume. And by decreasing your blood volume, you're going to decrease your blood pressure. All right, so that's it. Those are the, the ones I want you to know to regulate blood pressure. All right. So let me stop sharing my screen. Well, does anybody have any specific questions before I stop sharing the screen that you want me to show you on here? Not at the moment. All right. All right, so in the Engage Lab Manual, you can read through the chapter. In fact, I, I always like y'all to read through the chapter anyway. But most of the stuff is the stuff I already talked about besides everything in the middle is the anatomy. Um, all this stuff we talked about. There is a section that is not in my packet that is right here. I want you to start reading under shock and common blood vessel disorders, all right? So I need you to review that, most definitely. So this area is the only added area right here. 